Hello and welcome to World History Encyclopedia. My name is Kelly and today I'm joined with author and scholar John Lee. John is a professor at the University of California at Santa Barbara and much of his work focuses on the history of ancient West Asia, especially war, society and culture in the Greek and Achaemenid world from circa 650 to 330 BCE. Today though, we're going to be chatting all about his new book, The First Black Archaeologist, A Life of John Wesley Gilbert, published by Oxford University Press. Thank you so much for joining me. Let's start off by talking about what the book is about and who this archaeologist is. Okay. Uh, first of all, it's great to, to be here. Uh, John Wesley Gilbert was born in rural Georgia in 1863. Uh, he was born into slavery, uh, and he rose uh, from those beginnings to become nationally known uh, as a scholar, uh, as an educator, a uh, community leader, uh, and, and a missionary. Uh, and his, one of his uh, great accomplishments was being the first African-American scholar to go to Greece in 1890 uh, to conduct professional archaeological work, hence the title uh, of the book. Uh, but his life encompassed uh, a wide range of, uh, of activities uh, that uh, go beyond uh, his archaeological work. Right. So in your book, you talk about all of that, so both his life and also... Yeah, so uh, <laughs> uh, my book is a story of, you know, of a boy who grows up um, in poverty, facing racism, uh, facing violence, a boy who seemed like he would have no opportunities. But mm -hmm. thanks to dedicated teachers, uh, both black teachers and white teachers, uh, thanks to his own just unceasing drive to learn more uh, and to, to better himself, uh, and thanks to opportunities that, that presented um, themselves to him unexpectedly, he was able to, to rise from those humble beginnings uh, really to be a, a national figure and to achieve in a lot of different areas. And so my book takes this story from uh, his boyhood uh, in Augusta, Georgia, uh, through his early education in Georgia. It takes him to his uh, years at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, where he was uh, only the third African-American graduate of Brown University. Wow. Uh, yeah, and then it takes him to, uh, to Athens, Greece in 1890, where he was one of the very first students of a new research institute called the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. It was the, the, the first research institution that the United States had ever planted, uh, planted over, wow. overseas. Um, and so in doing that, he became one of the first 50 Americans of any race or any ethnicity or any background uh, to do professional archaeological work in Greece. And he traveled all over Greece. Uh, he wrote a thesis uh, at the American School uh, that would help him earn an advanced degree from Brown. So he became Brown's uh, first African-American advanced degree recipient, and also one of the first, first African-Americans anywhere in the United States to have a classical studies uh, advanced degree. Uh, and then he excavated uh, on the island of, uh, sorry, the island of Euboea uh, at the ancient site of Eretria, which is north of Athens. Uh, and he was one of the, part of one of the very first American excavation teams uh, in Greece. So my book tells that story, and that's kind of the heart of the story. But I also follow his life after, uh, after Greece. Mm -hmm. And in the years after he returned from Greece in 1891, uh, he was a professor of Greek and uh, English and German uh, at Payne College, uh, which is a small uh, college in Augusta, Georgia, that had been founded to educate black students uh, by a, a, a cooperative venture of both black and white Methodists in the South. It was a very, very, it was, it was unique, basically, in the South, a Southern institution that was cooperatively run uh, by an interracial board of, of trustees. And he devoted his life to that uh, in many different aspects, and also became a leader in his hometown of Augusta, in the church, uh, in community, in civil rights. Uh, and so he was, uh, he was very active in many spheres of life. And if that weren't enough, that would be an active life. Um, in 1911, um, Professor Gilbert uh, joined a white bishop, um, Walter Russell Lambeth, of uh, the Methodist Episcopal Church South, which was a white-dominated uh, Methodist denomination, uh, and together, Bishop Lambeth and Professor Gilbert uh, embarked on an eight-month journey to what was then the Belgian Congo uh, in an endeavor to establish a Methodist 
mission there. Uh, and they succeeded in, in, in doing that. Uh, they made contact uh, with uh, the local leader uh, at a place called Wembo Niyama, and they, they laid the groundwork for a mission that exists uh, in some form up until this day. Uh, so Professor Gilbert had a very, very eventful life, and I trace all that from his boyhood days following all the way until his death, and I also try to place him into the broader context of his time and talk a bit about his, about his legacy. Wow. Sounds like an amazing man. So many different things in one lifetime, which is pretty amazing. What made you want to write the story of this man? Why, why this book? Well, I, the funny thing is, is I did not start off planning to write a book about John Wesley Gilbert. I, as you know, my main field is ancient Greece and Achaemenid Persia, the, the first empire of, of Persia. Uh, and my career for, uh, most of my career has been devoted to publishing on, on, on those topics. And I actually got into uh, Professor Gilbert's life by sort of by accident, by chance. I was looking for a side project because I was bogged down, I think it's a fair to say, in another project on the ancient world. Sure. And I thought, here's a, someone I don't know anything about. Uh, and I, I just got curious. Mm. And the reason I got curious is that um, I mentioned the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. Well, Professor Gilbert was there in 1890 to 91. I was a student there in 1996 to 1997. And I didn't know it at the time, but I, I sat in the same library room where he did. Uh, I visited many of the same archaeological sites that he did. Uh, in essence, I, I walked in his footsteps before I had even heard of him. And so when I heard, uh, I read a short article by a classical scholar named Michelle Valerie Ronick, who's done a lot of work with early African-American uh, scholars in classical studies. And Professor Ronick's article kind of fascinated me. And I thought, well, I'll just, you know, I'll write a bit more about, about Gilbert and Greece because it'll be quick. It'll be easy to be an article. Uh, and I slowly found myself being drawn in. It was a story that I knew nothing about. Wow. Uh, you know, I grew up in, in Asia and in Hawaii, uh, and I knew very little about the history of, of the U.S. South. I did not know uh, the, about the incredible achievements of African-American education mm -hmm. uh, in the post-Civil War period. And the more I learned, the more interested I got in this tiny article that I thought I would write more into morphed into a book. Um, so, I mean, it's a great example of how sometimes the, 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 the best projects come when you're not looking for them. Definitely. So you've not only got this personal sort of connection to this man, did you ever stumble upon his name at all in your work on Greece? Because so you've done, or is it not really in your area? That's, no, that's a good question. Um, no, I hadn't. And that's part of also part of my story. So I mentioned um, Professor Gilbert's uh, uh, Congo mission. Because of that mission, he was well known and remained well known throughout the 20th century in the Methodist tradition. So um, his denomination, the, the, the Christian Methodist Episcopal or CME Church, uh, which is an African American denomination, uh, as well as the United Methodist Church, which absorbed uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the denomination of Bishop Lambeth. These churches, these various Methodist churches, have long revered Gilbert for his role in the Congo mission. And it's part of those, kind of the shared heritage of those groups. But in the archaeological side, uh, I think archaeologists of uh, Americans working in Greece have not thought enormously about their own history until recently. I mean, there have people have studied it, but it, it's been, you might say, more institutional rather than 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 personal. Mm. Uh, and so on the one hand, Gilbert was very well known uh, from the church perspective, but from the perspective of um, archaeology and especially classical archaeology, he was he was basically forgotten until um, I mentioned that brief article by Professor Ronick until she began to 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 explore the lives of these African-American scholars. So was he the only one that was sort of forgotten in that archaeological history of Greece? Or was there others that now are sort of slowly gaining the limelight that they deserve? Well, there are, there are many other uh, African-American classical scholars whose lives are now becoming better known. Uh, and if we're just talking there, of course, there are, there are people as early as the as the as the early modern period who are working in, in Europe, um, people who are African scholars, African scholars of classics. But in terms of the post-Civil War United States, you know, there now there's increasing attention 
on on these uh, figures, uh, uh, both men and women who uh, many of whom pursued their careers in the segregated South, but others who um, stepped out onto a national stage. Uh, the most famous example is William Sanders Scarborough, uh, who was also from Georgia. He was uh, uh, about a decade older than, than Gilbert, and he became nationally known. He was perhaps the most famous uh, black classical scholar of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, but as far as Greece, uh, Gilbert was the first African-American to go to Greece to study archaeology. And into the 20th century, uh, he is the only one of whom I am, uh, of whom I'm aware. Right. Um, and there are, of course, many African-Americans who went to Greece uh, as travelers. Uh, as ministers, uh, uh, later as tourists, and there are even some expatriates that we know of uh, uh, as early as the 1800s. But uh, into the 20th century, Gilbert was really the uh, the first and the only, for a long time, the, the, the only uh, African-American archaeologist. You know, classical archaeology, uh, Greek archaeology, and, and Roman archaeology is kind of set off in its own world from the archaeologies of other parts uh, of the world. And so, uh, in North American archaeology, you have people, uh, uh, African Americans, participating both as trained archaeologists uh, and as others who are uh, as, as as who are not trained, but they make important uh, important discoveries uh, and participate uh, uh, not only as workers but as people who discover sites and so on. So, um, when I call them the first black archaeologists, it's really. Uh, uh, following the lead of the Society of Black Archaeologists, who the, the, the term they used in 2012 was the first professionally trained archaeologist of African-American descent. Uh, and so that's a much more um, precise way to say it um, in the terms of the Society of Black Archaeologists. Uh, and yeah, it's, it just helps to understand that, that archaeology of Greece and Rome in the Near East is, uh, is only one part of the many different archaeologies uh, that exist uh, around the world. Absolutely. It must have been so fascinating to read about his illustrious career, I guess, and his exciting life. What was the most interesting or fascinating or surprising thing that you learnt about him and his life during your research and during writing this book? Uh no, that's that's a, 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 a great question. So one of the, the interesting things is that um, I had to reassemble Gilbert's life basically from fragments because uh, he had uh, four children, three of whom survived uh, into adulthood, but and they married, but they never had any children. Grand, he had no grandchildren. And so his papers, family letters, possessions, those were all lost. And then the archives of Payne College, uh, the school where he taught at, were tragically destroyed in a fire in 1968. So if you ask, you know, what, what did I have to read? At first glance, it didn't seem like I had anything at all because the, the, everything was destroyed or lost. Uh, and uh, I mentioned earlier, I'm an, I'm an ancient historian. So this is what we do all the time. You know, we're used to working with fragments of the past. And maybe that explains, what, you know, another reason why I was drawn to the project, because it was a kind of a mode of research I was, I was, I was attracted to and I had some familiarity with. Uh, and amongst those fragments, I think the most exciting things are to read Gilbert's own writing, there, because there are fragments of his writing that survive from Greece. Uh, and also from the Congo, and they survive as quotations in other sources, or a newspaper might reprint part of a letter he sent from Athens, um, and I was able to find uh, those documents, and therefore to hear Gilbert's story in his own words. Uh, and I think that hearing, uh, reading his own words uh, and finding them uh, in this uh, very roundabout way, despite the difficulties of the sources, I think that was that was that was very exciting. That is awesome. And I mean, that's definitely something that anyone who's done any study of ancient history will understand of finding bits here and bits there and then trying to reconstruct a timeline or reconstruct an event based on all of these different little bits and pieces. It's such a difficult job. Did it take you a while to get through all of the bits and pieces that you had? Plus, were there any sort of other secondary sources that you had available to help reconstruct his life? Yes. So uh, I, I started working on this in 2015. So, in, you know, in book time, that's not for human, you know, humanities scholars who write a book, I suppose I'm around the, you know, the, it's not unusual to spend the better part of a decade. Uh, 
I, well, actually, one thing that's important to, to say is that I had good timing. So I, I visited Georgia, I visited Rhode Island, I visited South, Car uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, I went to Greece. Though There were places where I was able to find documents that um, talked about Professor Gilbert that came from the, the network of scholars around him. Right. And so I was able to find that kind of evidence, and I was able to do all of that by the end of 2019. Oh. And I don't need to tell you that. That is so lucky. If I had been... <laughs> Months later, it, I would I, the book would not be done, uh, and so uh, you know, Gilbert would have probably said it was providential that that happened. And then by the time I was working on on the Congo, and I needed material from archives in in the in the southern states of the United States, um, many of those archives were open again: Mississippi, Tennessee, Georgia. So that at the ending part, I was able to order documents from from archives. So. Uh, I, I, you know, it, a lot of it has to do with, with timing and the, this better part of a decade, if I had been off by a few months, uh, I would still be, be, be struggling. And I, I say that partly because I know that there are other scholars out there who have had those challenges and I, and I, I you know, I'm, I'm deeply sympathetic because I just happened to be, you know, my timing happened to be, to be good and I was able to finish the book mm. um, in, in time. Something that should have been fairly routine, being able to pop over to another country and, you know, access this stuff suddenly became so oh, difficult yes. for so many people. Yes. Yeah. What do you think is one person, one thing that everybody should know about the life of John Wesley Gilbert, or your book in general? My, 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 my book in general. Boy, that's a, just one thing. Oh, um, a couple of things that you think is an okay. important thing that people can take away right. or know about it. So first, uh, about Professor Gilbert um, if, uh, as a person, um, he was an, an incredible ling linguist. He he mastered classical Greek and classical Latin which was the standard for education in those days. But he spoke French very well. He spoke modern Greek very well. Uh, he spoke uh, German decently well, and he, could, he, he spoke it well enough to, to teach it uh, to, at, at his school. Um, he studied Hebrew, uh, a biblical Hebrew, as part, of, as, part of his, uh, as part of his work. And then when he went to Africa, he mastered uh, the conversational basics of two African languages, uh, the languages Shiluba, and Otatela, and these are languages that are spoken in what is today the Congo. Uh, and those languages he, he, he studied uh, later on in his life. So the first thing is, here's someone who was uh, intellectually gifted, and you know, he just he, he had the ability to, to uh, master these languages um, and, and then also to teach them, which is another, another part of it. Uh, um, and to balance it off for Gilbert as a person, uh, I, uh, he was good with children, and this is a kind of a you know it's a like it's a book about a scholar. But uh, one of the striking things about him is that 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 he was good with children, and he know he knew how to interact with kids, and kids loved him, and they would come up to him and talk to him, and and uh, this comes out in uh, in the Congo mission where his white uh, partner Bishop Lambeth mentions in his diary all the children love Gilbert, they crowd around him at every stop. Uh, and even the you know the chief of the village will let the, his son sit on Gilbert's knee, uh, and so that's another part of uh, of his life that you know I think is equally important you know being a father in a way um, it's 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 it gives you equally important insight into his character uh, that um, he had the kind of kindness and patience needed um, needed to, uh, to 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 be good with be good with the kids as well as being you know intellectually intellectually brilliant uh and a, and a gifted gifted teacher it's the kind of information uh, you wouldn't yeah. normally get to know about a person from history like it's a very personal thing that normally you know if you get any sort of sources about a person you don't tend to get how they are with their family or their kids that's a deeply intimate mm -hmm. thing to know about him which is lovely yes yeah yeah no it, it is um you know i think this is also i would uh uh, I mentioned his children, you know, his, his, his uh, third daughter um, died at age 18 very suddenly, probably of an infection or appendicitis, just when she was about to go to, co to, uh, to, go to college. And uh, all of his children uh, uh, accomplished uh, things in their own spheres, but um, she seems to have been the one who's kind of destined for a very, very bright future, and then her life was very tragically cut short. So, so uh, you know, in his own life, he also had, yeah, he also had to, 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 to um, to you know, uh, uh, confront that kind of kind of personal tragedy, and I mention this to to say, you know, these are ways of saying that this is someone who um, was a complex and multifaceted person. 
um, who's not just a, you know, a, a abstract figure we're going to put on a pedestal and say, look, but, but I try in my book really to bring out the different facets of his, uh, of his life. Um, and as much as I can from the fragmentary sources to, to, to reveal, you know, how people saw him as a, as a person. Yeah. It, uh, um, it's, a, it's, it's a great story. So now if you had, if I, if you were going to ask me, what should people know about Professor Gilbert in a wider context? Um, I would say that Gilbert is, in, in one respect, not unusual. And that is because he is part of, I think, one of the greatest achievements in the, the history of the United States. And that's the rising up of uh, African Americans uh, during and after the Civil War, um, coming to freedom and then coming to education. Right. Uh, and Gilbert was not unusual in, in pursuing learning with this, with this deep, deep, deep uh, enthusiasm. Uh, we have many, many sources from the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s that talk about uh, uh, young people, old people, men, women, boys, girls, all striving to learn. And if you look at the, the speed with which uh, the, the rate of black illiteracy declined mm -hmm. uh, in the United States in the 19th century, uh, basically around 1870, I, I may get the figures wrong, but it was on par with the national or the international um, average. So 80% of African Americans uh, or more were illiterate. Um, and that had fallen off in a generation uh, to under 20%. And I think this is just amazing. And it's a story that anybody who knows the history of um, HBCUs or historically black colleges and universities is familiar with, but it's a story that in our wider um, wider conversations in the United States is maybe not as well known. And it's just, it's so inspiring. It's so remarkable. Um, it is so humbling to see people who are, who are striving for education. And they did so in the face of, uh, you know, uh, racism, violence. Uh, at the end of the 1800s, we're talking about, you know, the imposition of the Jim Crow um, apartheid regime in, in the United States. Uh, this is a, a, a Professor Gilbert's life is a part of this big mosaic of, of extraordinary achievement um, that I, I think that, uh, that people should, should know more about. Brilliant. And obviously now people can know a lot more about by picking up your book <laughs> and reading all about his life and his achievements. Did you have any involvement with the community in Augusta, Georgia, while researching and working on this book? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I, I did. I, uh, you know, I mentioned that I had been a student in Greece, and, and so I'd been to Greece before many times, and I, 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 I went again to Greece in the course of my research. But I had never been uh, to Augusta, Georgia. I mean, aside from maybe a brief visit to a Atlanta, I really had not had much experience in uh, Georgia at all. So I made several trips there, and uh, I received invaluable mentorship and guidance and help from many people in the community. And a, a, a couple that I would mention uh, by name is uh, Dr. Mallory Millinder, who taught uh, French and journalism at Payne College for many years. And he uh, is the college's historian. So we first met actually online. Uh, we were introduced uh, by a friend of, of Dr. Millinder's, uh, uh, Reverend Ashley Calhoun, uh, whose father had been the president of Payne College in the 1950s and uh, to, the, to 1970. So uh, I, when I went to Augusta, uh, Dr. Millinder took me everywhere, helped me meet people, showed me the important places uh, that were related to Gilbert's life. Uh, and he introduced me to many others in, uh, in the Augusta community, uh, people who worked uh, for historic preservation groups, uh, people who were uh, involved with the Lucy Craft Laney Museum of Black History, uh, Historic Augusta, many or other organizations, and of course, uh, to Payne College, where Dr. Millinder was an alumnus himself. Uh, so this is a book that came out, you know, came out of my interactions with this local community. Um, and I'd like to say whenever I give a talk that this is, you know, this is the story of Payne College and it's the story of the people uh, of Augusta and especially of its African-American community. And I'm really just the messenger. Like I'm, uh, I, it was, you know, it was just given to me to tell this story and to, to share it with a broader world. Uh, but I got help from so many people in, uh, in Augusta and I, I could go on and name maybe I, well, the one other uh, uh, person I would, would, would uh, mention is Ms. Alana Lewis, who is the archivist at Payne College. And I mentioned that Payne's archives had been destroyed, but bits and pieces survived. 
and more things kept coming. And uh, Ms. Lewis played a very, a very crucial role in organizing and preserving and putting together this material so that it was available for a researcher like me to come uh, and, and to visit. And she and her staff, and in fact, everybody that I interacted with in Augusta uh, were always so um, welcoming and helpful uh, and friendly. Uh, you know, everything from touring the historic neighborhoods of the city to being on campus uh, to um, meeting uh, meeting uh, uh, people from various churches. I mean, I, I really, really, it was one of the very special things about this book was to, to interact uh, in that way. Because, you know, if you do ancient history, you know, people you're studying are, well, they've been dead for a long, long time. And, and it, it, it was very, very uh, meaningful to, to make a difference um, by contributing to this community's uh, history. Amazing. That's, that's just amazing. And that definitely makes me think of um, the sort of archaeology that um, archaeologists in Australia are now working towards. And it's very like a community-based archaeology. And it's mm -hmm. working with yes, the community yes. to learn about their history. So that is, that's amazing that you could go and talk to these people. You mentioned the, you know, the, the way that archaeology is moving in Australia now. I could add something about the, like the future. Uh, in the sense that, you know, I, I've written a book uh, about a, a pioneering figure of, of about a century ago. Uh, and it's important that we acknowledge uh, his legacy and his accomplishments. Uh, and, uh, and along with the many other people, you know, who have sort of been sort of hidden figures. But I think it's also, I hope that this book will prompt people to think about in our own day, um, with students who may be young and may 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 face challenges to getting an education, may not have opportunities, um, may not be drawn to one scholarly field or another. Like I hope that that my book also makes um, everyone to read it think about like how can I create opportunities for for others? Um, and if if there are scholars, um, you know how can we make it so that we have um, as broad a range of perspectives and people that come into uh, into our fields? And so um, you know I, academic books. You know, uh, they are not, they don't tend to sell a lot of books, but if this reading about this story from the past prompts someone to think about what um, can be done for, for today and for the future, uh, uh, then I think that um, that would, you know, that would be, it would be another way to honor Professor Gilbert's um, legacy. The story and life of Professor Gilbert transcends beyond his lifetime. And I think about the struggles that he faced. Uh, and the way he persevered. And I think that we can draw inspiration from that um, and not just be content to go like, oh, that was a great story from the past, but think how can we bring this kind of spirit into our, our present? So everyone who's interested in reading the book, you can find a link to purchase it down below. And thank you so much for joining World History Encyclopedia today. Thank you so much. This video was brought to you by World History Encyclopedia. For more great articles and interactive content, head to our website via the link below. World History Encyclopedia is a non-profit organisation and you can find us on Patreon, a brilliant site where you can support our work and receive exclusive benefits in return. Your support helps us create videos twice a week, so make sure to check it out via the pop-up in the top corner of the screen or via the Patreon link down below. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you soon with another video.